everybody say take courage it is Jesus don't be afraid then I'll read again verse 28 the Lord if it is you Peter replied tell me to come to you on the water come he said then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came towards Jesus but when he saw the wind he was afraid and beginning to sink cried out Lord save me amen immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him you little f you of little faith he said why did you doubt and when they climbed into the boat the wind died then those who were in the boat worshipped him saying truly you are the son of God truly you are the son of God dear God I plead the blood of Jesus not my will but your will be done don't let me speak but speak through me Holy Spirit I'm just a vessel that oh God you have appointed to stand before your children don't allow me to say anything that you have not given me to say but only your way oh God therefore father I empty myself so that your anointing may be real in my life therefore father touch anyone that needs a touching and they bring deliveries set free those that are in captive in Jesus name Amen you may take your seats the miracle of Jesus walking on the water is not just something biblical scholars and devout Christians know it is a story that almost everyone knows here is the problem with the famous miracles like this one. We tend to focus on the act itself. We forget about the cost that was involved for Jesus to perform this miracle. However, every time you read the Bible and see Jesus doing something amazing, you have to ask yourself why did he perform such a miracle even today if a, someone who was dying was to come back to life would be asking why did Jesus heal him Jesus had a purpose for everything he did including miracles when you look into the parables of Jesus, there's nothing that he did where there was no purpose. His birth had a purpose. His life in the manger had a purpose. When the mag came to seek him, had, there was a purpose. When Jesus, they were escaping him to go into a safe place, there was a purpose. So, when he performed the miracles there was a purpose his life there was a purpose his death there was a purpose now we begin to realize that these purposes of Jesus there's something that is so real they are called signs why are they called signs because they are pointing us to the truth signs and wonders they point us to the truth that this is a supernatural and is done by the supernatural power now you all and I we know these days that there are magicians that try to imitate the signs and the wonders that are done in the supernatural way but those signs are not compared to when Jesus performed signs. You remember when Moses was performing the signs and the wonders to make the children of Israel go to the promised land. There was something that was happening. Pharaoh ordered the magician 
to go there and so that they can do the same thing. But then we begin to see that God supersedes the natural ability of man because the science of man is limited, but the science of God is unlimited. So we begin to see that the signs of men were swallowed by the supernatural presence of God. So the act of magicians, the fortune tellers, or the things that are happening, they can never be compared to what God does. There are two purposes to why Jesus walked in the water. Let me say the first one. It was to reveal his divinity. Divinity. He is a supernatural God. He has been living with us. And we have never recognized him at all. And the God at this particular moment, he has said, because you do not recognize who I am, let me show you that I can do the things that you cannot do. So at this particular moment, God chooses to walk on the water. He's revealing who he was in the deed of the Godhead. The second thing was to bring his divinity near to us. We always wonder where is God when we need him. And the God at this moment, he says, I'm going to draw myself close to you. Things are not going on well, but I'm going to reveal myself who I am. And when I reveal myself who I am, I'm going to cause you to understand that I'm not just a normal being like you are, although I'm living in a normal body before you were ours and the fact that before you were ours I want to reveal that I can bring the glory that I had with the father before the foundation of the earth to you and so God what does he do he brings that glory to us and he says now you can live with with what I have been living with in the heavens so what is he telling us? All power is given to mankind. What we are and what he was is not anymore a mystery. He's revealing to us that these things that I'm doing, you are capable of doing them. He's revealing to us that there's nothing impossible when you believe in me. So we see the two things that he's doing. Reveal his divinity. Bring his divinity to us. So we begin to see God is doing something that no man can do. Like another account in the Bible, this story also must be interpreted in its own context. In order to understand the author's original intentions. Why was the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John writing about this. The story unfolds followed by the messianic uproar. In response, Jesus immediately sent his disciples away while he dismissed the crowd and they went up on the mountainside by himself. What did he do? He went to pray. So you and I, to achieve something before God, it's important that we pray. Everybody say pray. pray. There's nothing that we can do. We can never tap into God without prayer. You know, this is what we want to do because I'm a Christian. I want things to happen because I'm a child of God. Now God is revealing to us, no, things they don't happen like that. Things they happen because you are disciplined to spend some time and seeking my face. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name shall turn away from all evil and give their lives, themselves to the Lord, i will come down and heal their land. So we begin to see something here that is unique. Here is a God that lived as a God that is a triune God, God 
in three persons and it, as we are seeing this God then he comes to the point where he reveals to us his majesticness that I'm here, I need to communicate with the Father, but the way how I communicate, it needs isolation or it needs discipline. I need to separate myself from you all and I'm going to spend some time to seek his face. The Bible says, seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be what? Added. Now, why did Jesus invade such a good opportunity? Being the king of Jews sure sounds impressive. Because when these people, they saw all what he did, turning the water into wine and things like that, they want to make him a king. And they said, let's make you a king. And Jesus realizes this, I was a king before you thought of making me a king. But I'm here on a mission. Somebody shout, there is a mission. God has a mission in our lives. That was not his mission. However, God's plan for him was to suffer and to die so that we shall be saved. The devil had hijacked the plans of salvation. The devil had blindfolded us to understand who we are supposed to be. Likewise, God has a plan for each and every one of us. Do you know what is the plan in your life? If you don't, if you've been seeking God to realize and to find out what God has purposed you. Have you ever asked the question, God, why did you create me? Why am I alive? What are the things that you desire me to do? Here's something that I want you to understand. He wants us to stick to the plan before he can bless us. And the reason why sometimes we miss the divine will of the Father is because we are seeking the gift, but we are not understanding who we are before him. Amen. It sounds good to have a gift of an evangelist, to have a gift of a pastor, to have a gift of a prophet, to have a gift of an apostle, but without seeking to the plan to say, God discipline me so that I can have a relationship. And these are the things that we are trying to implement on, on the home fire group is that we become a community that knows how to have relationship. Relationship with God is not a Sunday thing. Relationship with God is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. Sunday is a 24-7. Every second, every minute, every hour, we need to have that relationship where we know nothing but Jesus. So when we begin to understand this kind of relationship, we begin to honor the divine plan that is in our lives. Our day-to-day -day jobs or businesses or gifting that he gives us begin to bow and honor God and then God begin to bless what we do because we have honored God. Amen. Before we honor God, we will not receive the breakthrough. But when we begin to honor God and say, God, I'm going to isolate myself and surrender my every will, my every desire, my every ambition, my every mind, then we shall see what God does. Glory to God. Is somebody hearing me? Shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I wanted to say these things. There are a number of things that disturb us from achieving our goals as the children of God. Number one, let me say distractions. What are your distractions that has hindered you to understand who God is? What is the distraction that hindered the, those disciples to know this is God? There are distractions in our life that blindfolds us because everything is going on well. We can't see the wheel under the pattern where God is leading us. 
And we begin to think we can do it on our own and we ignore what a God can do. And we ignore to realize that this is not our will, this is God's will. That's why Jesus in his immutability, his all sovereignness, his all God who knows when the disciples ask, he says, how should we pray? One of the things he said to the disciples, pray these ways, not my will, but your will be done in where? He, in heaven, in earth as it is in what? So God desires us to understand. Distractions. What are the distractions? The crowds wanted Jesus to be the king over them. This was sure a distraction because it was not the plan the father had for him in mind. The father had the plan for him to be a ransom who vindicates us from the sins. Who justifies us just as if we have never sinned? The father had the plan. Don't allow the devil to push you in a trap. And allow ego come all over you. It's just the devil just trying to trick you. Remember, whenever the enemy tricks you, he makes it to look so good. But when God is showing you the way, he makes it to look as if there is nothing that is going to happen. This day, whom are you going to choose? The will of the enemy or the will of God? The devil knows how to trap you and leave you trapped. By the time when you realize you are trapped to your neck. But today I want to set you free. As the Bible says, who the Son of God set free, he is free indeed. So God, he is working something in our life. Jesus' response to this was twofold. He immediately withdrew from the source of destruction, which was the crowd. Sometimes we need to withdraw from all the noises that are in Bethel and just go in the closet and say, God, I want to hear your voice, not man's voice. Oh, I wish somebody can hear me. There is a time that we just need to separate ourselves and say, God, please, I don't want to hear man's voice. I'm just going to be by myself, by my bed, and pray, God, come. Let your will be done. So God is withdrawing from distraction. And they went to God in prayer. His principles were simple but powerful. Amen. The principles of God are simple but powerful. You see, another principles needs to be studied, but the principles of God is willingly and obedient. The Bible says if we are willing and obedient, we shall eat the good of the land. Another principle needs a timetable, a schedule, a calendar, but the principles of God needs a time to talk to God. So we see his principle. They were simple, powerful. Destruction must be put to death. You must not allow the spirit of destruction come and entangle you. Messlessly look at the devil to say, devil, I know who you are. I know where you come from. I know the, the source, how you originated. And now, in the name of Jesus, I'm putting you underneath my feet. Amen. The devil knows how to offer us a nice thing before the real beauty comes in. Don't listen to the lie of the devil. Look at the devil. My beauty is about to come. My beautiful thing is about to arise. My God is forever here and he cares for me. There is a miracle that's about to take place. Not tomorrow but now. A, a day may seem a little longer but I know my God has the timetable for now. You know, the difficult thing is to wait. 
that you see what God is about to do. That's the difficult thing. Is to wait. And the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and never be weary. They shall walk and never faint. But one of the things that I have found in life is the time to wait. Because waiting looks like forever. But when you wait, the beauty comes. Because God comes in. God visits those that wait upon him. Hallelujah. God visits those that wait upon him. Because when God comes to visit you, he doesn't visit you, he leaves you with his glory. Every other visitation is only there for temporary time. But the God's visitation is there to stay. There is a glory of God that is coming to stay at Home City Church here in Buffalo. And then when that glory comes, believe me, we will have no place to put the people because it's going to be a tsunami of revival. Before we lay hands on the people, people they will be receiving the healing and the people they will ask what is happening in here. Why is it because we have been waiting upon God? God, I wish somebody can praise God for a little second. Shout hallelujah. <laughs> Waiting. Nobody wants to wait because we are used to live in the world of spontaneous. Go to Burger King, go to McDonald's, instant coffee, instant beggar, instant KFC things are just done you don't know where they just bowed and thrown out there it's just like in hell in hell there's no waiting but in heaven there's room to wait hallelujah things that happen in hell is so quick and these disciples they began to question is this God is this the one who we are prophesied to? Jesus knew that's why he withdrew. Amen. The miracles of Jesus walking on the water are recorded in three gospels which we call the synoptics gospel. In Matthew, Mark and John came on the heels of miraculous feeding of 5,000. How does Jesus feed the 5,000? with five rows of bread and two baskets of fish. When God touches something, it multiplies. It doesn't only make it satisfying, it fills you. Oh, hallelujah. How many are waiting for God to multiply your blessing? How many are waiting for God to make your blessing beautiful? Well, we are about to get to Easter. God is about to reveal himself. And I believe we don't see Jesus because we are looking for Jesus to come and shoot from the sky. Jesus is saying, I'm in your midst. And I'm about to touch your life. And I'll change everything. And you will never be the same again. Those who have never waited upon me, they will hate you and they'll think you are proud. Because you have realized how to stay put and to simply say, the my time is coming with Jesus. Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when I was young in the ministry, I always desired to have a church that is growing real, real fast. I wanted to see 10,000 people. Ooh, glory to God. I'm the man of God. Mm -hmm. And I'll go there on the pulpit and I'll preach like I'm down in the south. And God, mm -hmm. and I'm just there humming and I'm feeling good. And God is saying, No, son, wait. One by one, let them be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. And as I fill them and transform them, 
And as they begin to be a community and begin to reach one by one, they will not change people from the churches only, but they will change people who are drunkards, who are drug addicts, who are prostitutes, who are doing all kinds of things. They will bring them to the fold. And when they come, they will be changed. Then hell will be emptied. We are here in the business of plundering hell and the populating heaven. We must empty every plan that the devil has put against this humankind. Nobody should die prematurely. We are going to seek the face of God that everybody that comes to home city church is going to have longevity and their lives will be transformed by the power of a living God. Man. There's nothing that I love like preaching. When I discovered the plan that God had for me, I knew I was born to preach. And I knew that I had found my niche because nothing else was exciting. Amen. Nothing else. I mean, if I miss, you know, I'm preaching, I'm not only preaching on a Sunday morning at the home city church. Get me in the workman, I run into somebody, I'll say, God bless you. If he asks me why you say God bless you, I'll explain why. Get me in the post office here in the United States, I'll say to somebody before I drop a letter, God bless you if I meet somebody. Get me in the tops, get me in the Walmart, get me in the mall, get me in JC Penn, get me everywhere is my pulpit. Where is your pulpit? Your pulpit should be not only here in the front, you are the voice of God. When God created you, he looked at you and they said you are my voice but it was a miracle of Jesus walking on the water that more than any other convinced Jesus disciples that he was indeed the son of God you can imagine our eyes can be blinded these guys, they were staying with Jesus, living with Jesus, walking with Jesus, <laughs> but not realizing that was Jesus. Amen? Amen? Have you ever realized that sometimes we can have a blessing and never realize we have a blessing? Have you ever realized you can be a blessing never realizing you're a blessing? These are the people, the disciples that changed the world and never realized there was potentiality there that they were still seeking for something else. Glory to God. What do they do when they see Jesus? The second, the first thing that I say is distraction. The second thing that comes to every Christian is fear. We are always afraid. Mark tells us that when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the, the water, they thought he was a ghost. See how our mind runs to bad things instead of to good things. You seeing Jesus, the first thing that comes, oh my God, I'm seeing a ghost. There are still a lot of people that are afraid of staying in the dark. There are people who can not even do anything by themselves because they are afraid. Fear hinders us from understanding what God wants to do. They cried out because they all saw him and they were terrified. And this brings us to the second significant point of this miracle. Jesus always comes to us in the storms of life. Jesus will always come to us in the storm. Are you in the storm? You know, Jesus wants to be God. And he is God. And he wants to reveal to say, what he is doing, you don't need to help him. He does it by himself. Amen? Several times we try to help Jesus. And Jesus will come to us in the time of storm. This is reminiscent of the words of God to Isaiah. What did he say to Isaiah? When you pass through the waters, 
I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Amen. Now he's revealing here, if you pass through the waters, you're not alone. How many times do we feel like we are alone? Because we don't see who is with us. Who is with us is greater than anything and anybody who is around us. Amen. Who is with us can solve a minute is years to God. Amen. I have a friend of mine. His children, they came over here. He came from Congo. And when he came from Congo, in that day they said, the following day they were going to kill him. He was one of our pastors when we were in Nashville, Tennessee. And they said to him, you know, his children they were here, probably you saw them, they come with that gentleman evangelist from Congo who was singing. They told him, he said, uh, tomorrow you're going to be killed. They arrested him because of political evils. He didn't do nothing. They suspected he was, he's a computer engineer and they were thinking, wow, he's the one who is messing around everything. But, you know, so they charged him and they said, your punishment is to be put to death. So my friend, he said, uh, that day he stayed in his cell room with five others that were going to be killed. And he told the people, he said, we can survive this. And the friend says, we can't. He says, no, we can survive this. He says, how? He says, God is going to take us out of here. And that's the way how he came to the United States. He reached over there. He started praying like he had lost his mind. He was praying. And from nowhere, one judge walked, one God walked in. He says, Right now, we are going to break some things to look like you have done break jail. And I want you to run out of here. If they catch you, I didn't open this gate. They are truly killing you at this morning at 8. And they broke some chains. They broke everything. And this brother walked out of there. He's going to come over here and he'll give this testimony. And he says they started running like they had lost their mind. He says, during daytime, they find a cave where they hid. He says, there were helicopters and everything looking for him. And in the nighttime, they got up and they ran until they ran into another country, Burundi. And when they reached there, they said, now God, we are free. This man is free today with his children and he's preaching the gospel in Mafospel, Tennessee because he realized that a minute with God was more than enough. Hallelujah. A minute with God is more than enough. And I remember when we had a church in Nashville, Tennessee, I ordained this man. He, he became one of our pastors in Nashville. And then now this man is preaching the gospel, telling the world what, how God saved you. Fear not, for the battle is not yours, but the battle is of the Lord. Amen. The Lord may not come at the time when we think he should come. Because he knows when we need him the most. Do you know when you need the Lord most?